vibratory massage system that soothes and refreshes. Foot Fixer makes my feet feel good. Uh. The Foot Fixer, the original, only from Clairol. Here's to all the people of British Columbia. Our best for you. There's no one else who does it quite the way you do. For all you do, it's much for you. Yeah, brewed here in the BC by the Bats. Budweiser, with its uniquely clean, crisp, beechwood-aged taste and smoothness, you'll find in no other beer. I will be in the opening. This bud's for you. Good morning and cheer up. Things are bound to get better in our economy one of these days. And who knows, it might be this day. This might be the day when sanity will return to the Vancouver waterfront and prevent the closing down of British Columbia. This might also be the day when Mark Lalonde will surprise us by making a positive statement on what he's going to do for the economy this winter as he outlines this afternoon in Ottawa his major statement on the three-day debate on the economy of the nation. Now, more locally, I've got a little progress report for you on the incredible case of Liv Bandiera, the woman who was charged with the murder of a child and who in August 1982 saw these charges stayed because there wasn't evidence for a murder charge. It may have been a grievous injustice to Liv Bandiera. Also this morning, we're going to give a fellow by the name of Paul Reitzma, who is the mayor of Port Alberni, a chance to tell us the good news, if any, about Alberni, which is widely regarded as an example of the faltering economy in British Columbia. Not Reitzma, I mean Alberni and the lumber industry in that part of the world. And then, I came into possession this morning of an incredible document, which takes old timers back to the, the Cold War of 51. This is a cover of Collier's magazine, which predicts in graphic detail Russia's defeat and occupation by the United Nations, led by the Americans, of course, in the years 1952 to 1960. Hard to believe that this was the attitude then. Well, we're still on the verge of nuclear war, and here this morning is uh, Dr. Endicott, who was vilified in the 50s as the kind of Red Dean or the Red Stooge, and who later was cleared by the United Church of Canada, which gave to him a reasonably handsome apology. And Dr. Endicott is here because this is disarmament week in Canada. And first off the top this morning, we're going to talk to, oh, I'm going to give you a couple of my views on what's going to happen or what should happen after the break. Labor relations on the Vancouver waterfront and in all the major ports in British Columbia have been a disaster for years. And now, of course, the politicians in the East who wouldn't know a container clause if they were hit over the head with it are making loud noises, yes, 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 unless Cunningham and his boys in the Maritime Employers Council and Garcia and his boys in the ILWU, unless they get down to serious bargaining and solve the problems right now, they, our great, all-powerful government, will order them back to work. And I'm quite sure, because there won't be an agreement between Garcia and Cunningham and his boys, I'm quite sure the employers will, the government will necessarily, in the next few days, probably about Monday or Tuesday of next week, order the docks back to work in British Columbia. Now, they must. We have 42 ships tied up on the West Coast ports. We've got half a million tons of grain 
sitting in elevators and in backed up rail cars. We've got total economic disaster facing British Columbia. Because if this strike were to go on, strike, lockout, call it what you like, they're both to blame, were to go on for long enough, the last one leaving British Columbia sawmills and pulp mills, and all our export and import trade would have to put out each and every last light. We used to sit back and nag and sneer at Seattle when they were in trouble with Boeing. We're the ones in trouble now. Now I would suggest to you that if we were in fact a cohesive nation with emergency services, what should be done is you put the army in to clear the ports. But we haven't got an army that could do it anyway, so forget that. We're in the hands of the Maritime Employers Association and the ILWU. And if they're ordered back to work, it'll help to keep the grain going, because you just point a chute from an elevator, and the handlers, who haven't got a contract either, point the chutes and the men on the ships fill the holes of grain. It'll keep the grain going, but it won't do anything to improve the disastrous labor, labor relations on all our ports and waterfronts. The funniest thing, down at the Westburn Terminals at Roberts Bank, there's a sane agreement between the ILWU and the people who run the coal port. And the men have a guaranteed income, they work three shifts, mind you, it's only the one commodity, and there's never, ever a strike. In Vancouver, we go through the agonies of the damned every year. Now, Cunningham, when he was on here the other day, did admit culpability of the employers to some point. They want to turn back the clock now. They want to scrap the container clause, which sees this de-stuffing of containers on the waterfront by the ILWU, which sees half of our container traffic coming up from Seattle instead of coming in here. And they want to straighten out the incredible labor rates on the waterfront. As Cunningham said the other day, it's the only place where you get overtime rates without working any part of a normally paid shift. And get the picture. You've got gangs on the day shift, many of them casuals, sons of longshoremen waiting to climb up the ladder. And on the day shift, you get 12.55 plus skill differentials. Then you get the afternoon shift, the graveyard shift, where you, when you go on the job, you get time and a half right away, $18 something an hour. And then if you're smart enough and senior enough on the board, you get the all-night shift, which are $25 an hour. And Cunningham said to me the other day, sure, an increase of some kind, but we're not going to add it to the base rate to pyramid the overtime shifts. We'll add it through the shifts, because they're stuck with that. Uh, and there's just, matter of fact, what's his name? Garcia was to be on here this morning, and I wanted to put all these things that Cunningham told us to him to see if the union would admit any culpability because the uh, union says they're locked out. Cunningham says, no, they're not locked out. They were giving us between 30 and 60 percent production on ships. They were striking. And we ain't going to pay guys who don't work but are on the payroll and getting all this fancy money for holding up ships. Now, there's no magic solution to the waterfront because it's been allowed to deteriorate in its antique practices for so long that uh, we're in a bad mess. And the nation, the West Coast, cannot be allowed to suffer endlessly because of the inability of these parties to come to some sane, sensible agreement. So Katia, or whoever's the guy in Ottawa now, they changed so quickly you need a roster to keep up with the cabinet ministers. Katia, He'll order them back to work, and it won't do a damn bit of good, except it'll get the grain moving. It will solve none of the problems in the Vancouver waterfront. I'm sorry, Garcia, what's the other guy's name? Kaufman. Kaufman. We weren't here this morning, so they could have a chance to defend themselves. But they are supposed to be talking, I think, this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Okie dokie. It's a mess. They'll have to be ordered back to work. If they have any sense right now, the union will give the guarantee that they will do a full day's work which Cunningham wants, and Cunningham will give someone and they should get back to work today. You can't stand around there on the waterfront and watch the whole economy of BC collapsing because of the selfish interests of two parties. It's nonsense. However, more nonsense than Ottawa. Lalonde, the finance minister, he really runs the country. He, I mean, he's the boss. 
he's going to make a major statement on the economy today. And there's going to be a three-day debate on the plans for economic recovery of this country. It's not all the Liberals' fault, but the lack of leadership is the Liberals' fault. Bennett and Curtis and Victoria and every other provincial premier across the country, unless they already know, must be biting their nails that the deficit federally is going to be up somewhere closer to 26 or 30 billion instead of the initial 10 billion. That's because of the loss of income and revenue and taxes and user's fees and all the rest of it. But the thing that worries the provincial politicians and, and should worry you is are they going to cut the transfer payments to the provinces? They've been talking about it for years and they have already cut some. But if they make any slashing cuts in the transfer payments, then you'll see services suffer in British Columbia. I've been mixing around a lot lately. I met a lot of people in very difficult circumstances. And I would suggest that one thing that Lalonde must do is extend unemployment insurance to the legitimate unemployed for the duration of this emergency. And uh, although Trudeau didn't sell it, the strong can help the weak. Those who are working must pay more unemployment insurance to provide, not welfare, but unemployment insurance with some dignity to the 1.3 million unemployed in this country today. And who knows? Maybe somebody will wake up and realize that for motivation among a nation, you must first have leadership. And that we ain't got at the moment, I'll tell you. Let's tell you the cheery story of Port Alberni after the break. Porto Berni has been picked on by the national press and the television all over the place as an example of our faltering economy. And I think at the worst, you normally have about 5,700 people who work in the Mac and Blow operations in, in the valley, don't you? We, we had, Jack, good morning. Good morning. morning to your viewers and as well good morning to the citizens of our good city in Port Alberni. Now you're not running for election here. You don't have to give I, us all these niceties, uh, Paul. Well, it's, uh, what was your worst period this summer as the plants were closing down for layoff periods? Well, according to some statistics released by the company, um, Oh, in, in, in August, and, August and September, um, we had about oh, maybe 12, 13 percent of the, of the hourly employees working in the various you mills. You mean about 1,500 instead of 5,700? Well, yeah. And Has it climbed back up since then? How many people are now working in the mills and the, the plants in the Albany Valley? The, the mill down at the moment is the um, uh, Alberni Pulp and Paper for two weeks from, uh, from the 26th till the 11th. And the APD and the SOMAS, AMB, and the Alply are uh, working at the moment. And I would say probably around a good 3,000 people. 3,000 people are working instead of your normal force of 5,700. Well, we had 5,800 in, um, in June 1981. And by December 1982 this year, it's likely to be down to 4,100. That includes a reduction of hourly people and, and staff people. It's, it's tough. We're in a very tough and trying situation. How does it affect the administration of the city? How, how many people have you got in welfare? I would have to check with the, with the welfare office. I don't think... Uh, you wouldn't know that as mayor? No. The, I uh, come in every morning and say, how many people are in welfare today? Uh, there are a fair amount of people on welfare, and unfortunately, UIC payments for many of them are running out. It's good for one year. And I must agree with the, the plea of the unions in town to the federal government to extend the one-year limit on UIC. We must have more um, extended periods of UIC in yeah. order to provide those who are unfortunate at the moment uh, with some, some income. Uh, many are in a des very desperate situation. And for a moment, uh, try, try to put yourself in the shoes of a young couple, such as myself, two, three children, not knowing whether or not in December they will be working. They've been unemployed for many a month. We went through a disastrous strike last year of three months, which we never should have had. Uh, they, they were out for 2% more, $500, and they went on strike for three months. Most unfortunate. Um, many people have half a paycheck, if not less. Uh, it's very tough, very tough in children, going to school. Um, in a dire situation. However, um, if UIC is being extended, at least it's much better than, uh, than, than welfare. 
And insofar as welfare is concerned, I think we should follow the example of Alberta. And able-bodied persons should be forced to work for their welfare rather than sit down and collect it. Oh, that's antiquated. No, it's... No, uh, no, no. You don't work for welfare, do you? There are many projects that could be done, for instance, in Alberni. What Probably rates are you going to pay? What rates are you going to pay if a guy's using his welfare check to work? Is minimum wage? There are, there are people that are on welfare that can work. I know of some situations uh, uh, broadcasted the other day in Vancouver, whereby a person um, stated he was desperate for work. Somebody phoned him up and said, I'll offer you $5. That's all I can afford. $4.50, $5, yes. And he said, no, that's, that's, that's not what I would like. A married man with four children would get more than that in welfare. Yeah, and the unemployment is around eight to nine hundred dollars at the moment. I know, and he wouldn't have to spend expenses. I'm not arguing forever to be in welfare forever or UIC forever, but you can't break down your whole social structure because of a temporary crisis. Well, the the, the crisis and indeed who, who is temporary. You, who would this, who would you decide was fit to work in welfare? Fifty-seven-year-old man with a bad back and uh, used to get compensation in the mills. Would you send him out to dig ditches for the city? No, I'm talking especially about the younger. Uh, the younger generation. So you'd pick on the young ones and say, no welfare unless you do well, some those public Well, those are able-bodied uh, people. But uh, let's go back to the temporary situation. And yes, we are in a tough time, right. very much so. Uh, we expect things to turn around. Uh, there are some good indicators from leading New York um, financial analysts. I sit as a director on the MFA. They expect the, the interest rates to go down to 7 and 8 percent. In the and States? That is what we, yes, and of course Port Alberni and this BC. We are so dependent on the housing market in the United States. We export about 50 percent of our wood products uh, lumber to the United States. 60 actually. A good 50 percent, okay, mm -hmm. 60. Um, it's, it's tough, it's very tough. Are many um, people losing their home? Well, if that happens, if the U.S. Is a, Domestic rates went down to <coughs> six or seven, seven or eight percent. It certainly would see a start up of housing starts in the United States, Very which would help us so. a lot. Yeah. Very definitely right. so. I'm not aware, I have not been advised of people that have lost their homes, and I'm almost in daily contact with the people of Port Alberni. I've got I a lot of phone banks calls. Are being, banks and lending institutions are very delicate in rushing foreclosures these days. And uh, they generally tend just to add the interest on to the capitalization of the mortgage, don't they? And aside from that, Jack, uh, if they foreclose, they cannot sell the housing anyway. Right. You couldn't sell a house in Albany tomorrow if you wanted to, could you? Well, the rates uh, for housing in Albany are somewhat lower than in the rest of B.C. Right. And incidentally, people are coming to Port Alberni to retire there because of the cheaper housing. Um, of course, the Alberni Valley itself, you've got a lot of fishing and hiking and um, good, good scenery. Well, you do well in tourism in the summertime, don't you? We had an Economic um, Development Commission sponsored Day of Discovery earlier this year, uh, trying to, to come to grips with the one industry town concept. Uh, we came to the realization that uh, uh, when things are well, of course, in the forest industry, uh, we're all doing well, although there's still people at that time were complaining because things weren't good enough and we're doing well. We came to the realization that we cannot depend anymore on the forest industry uh, as the being a one as industry a town. Provider. So we looked into tourism, and tourism is getting very big, especially the, uh, the, the fishing. Um, hundreds of thousands of pounds of fish are being caught. Um, the Pacific Rim, uh, we've got hiking, and the, the, the fishing, oh, the tourism. Can, we've got a new Harbor Park development. You, waiting can, you can sell me on the tourism, no problem at all. I wish you all the best of it, but I want you to tell me anything else positive that's happening in Albany, and I'm going to take calls right off the top this morning to Paul Wright's mother, mayor of Port Albany, after the break. Oh, by the way, you know, you're obviously not a liberal supporter, are you? Uh, no. And you um, certainly don't sound like an NDP. -er. Um, no, although they have some good ideas, too. But you're a so social creditor. I'm inclined that way, yes. And a Tory, nationally. Uh, I'm also inclined that way, yes. Mm. Go ahead from Albany to Mayor Reitzma. Hello. Did I make a mistake? It's impossible. Are you the caller from Albany? Yes. Oh, okay, go ahead now. Go ahead. Okay. Right. Speak up. 
What's wrong there? Uh, Shuswap Lake. Oh, yeah, go ahead from Eagle Bay and Shuswap Lake. Okay. Uh, I'd address this to the mayor. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the hard times in the 30s. And uh, I lived on the prairies. I remember the people that were on uh, what they called relief at that time, having to go out and shovel snow. And, uh, you know, it was absolutely degrading, not only for the parents, but for the children, eh? You know, we're looked down upon, frowned upon, uh, just uh, treated like animals. And when I hear somebody like the mayor say that these young people should go out and work for snow. their welfare, I know what's going to happen if it, if it ever comes to that. They're well, going to be degraded. I'll wait for your answer. Okay, thank you. Well, sir, I, I, I must strongly disagree with you. Uh, I've talked to many of the young people who would wish they could do some... Uh, some work and would wish to, to work for the welfare rather than sitting at home. Because sitting at home causes a lot of, uh, of anxiety at home, Wouldn't a lot of, of some difficulties with the, with the family, the How wife about and some children. spending on public works instead of degrading people by making them work for welfare? I, I don't find it degrading, I'm sorry, uh, working for welfare, uh, especially when, when people want, uh, uh, young people want that. Um, the best thing is extending the UIC until such time that jobs do become available. And the sad fact is that there are no jobs available, not in Port Alberni, not in, um, in BC or, or most of Canada. And the other point is, of course, when you get people added to the welfare rolls at all the time, the provincial costs are 50-50, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. So it puts an extra burden on the province, whereas if they're all on UIC extended for this crisis, at least those working could make bigger contributions and the federal government could equi equably pick up the deficit, couldn't it? I, yes, and I, I wonder with people not working now, there are, there's less and less UIC. And I wonder by the time I'm 60 or 65, if there will be enough payment to, to, to pay for our, um, I suppose, uh, Canada pension and whatever. <laughs> with the so. lesser amount of people working, of course. Go ahead in the next call, please. Go ahead. Hello. That's you. Yes, uh, just a short comment on the uh, mayor's idea mm -hmm. with uh, the young folks working for their welfare. Right. I'm uh, 22 and I've uh, been forced under the welfare rules and I'm more than willing to get out there and uh, work for my money. Okay, you know what, you do a day's work for what you get in welfare. Well, it beats the heck out of uh, just going up there and collecting it. it uh, you know, it's just like a handout is all it is. You might take volunteers to work for welfare, a young, fit guy, but I always think of the older fellow who's worked in an office all his life and has got a bad back and whatnot. You'd have to be very selective. Maybe they should have well, volunteers. Uh, Jack, I mentioned... Yeah, certainly they'd have to be selective. I, uh, this is why I mentioned able bodies, persons. Oh, uh, I didn't uh, hear that. I, I'm well aware, of course, that not everybody can. Um, but it's good to hear from, uh, good, from you, you, sir. How yes. much are you getting on welfare? About well, $300 a month, which is nothing. Are you married? No. You get 300, how much is your rent? Two and a half. <laughs> 250? Yeah. Why don't you go home to mother? <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> oh, where's mother, in Toronto? Pardon? Where's mother? No, right around where I live here. If you went home to mother, would they cut you off welfare? No, they just cut it back more. Maybe that's what you should do, but then somebody else will lose you 250 and we yeah, right. tumble things up. We'll try Port Albany again. Go ahead, please. Hello? That's you, sir. Hello? That's you. Yes, uh, I'd like to comment uh, about the special grant that uh, the mayor's office put through here in Port Alberni. The special what? Special grant. What For, special uh, grant? Parks and Recreation. Uh-huh. Now, we were told that we would have our unemployment renewed at our base rate. So I went on this grant for five months. Mm -hmm. Now they tell me I get 60% of what that grant was, and the difference must be made up by welfare. Do you know about this program? Well, I would, have to, I would have to look into that. But if this is the work sharing program, I, I wonder about that, because I've got that in my own office, which means that um, four days the staff will be working. The fifth day, they, uh, they take off in order to keep one of the jobs going, and they get 60% of that one day paid through UIC, and at least it, uh, it, it saves us a You're job. You're doing that in City Hall? No, no, in my own private business, in my travel business. In your travel business? Not in City Hall. Not in City Hall. Oh, no, I wondered no. about that. Thanks anyway. No. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. That's you. 
Oh, is that me, Jack? That's you. The oh, sorry, I got I got percolate. Yeah, regarding uh, the people working for welfare and the first caller said uh, back in the old days referred to as relief. Yeah. When they worked then, that was the option that the person had. And those who had pride, which the majority of the people, did in fact work. My dad was one of them. They got the same amount that the person did not work, but there was no degrading of children. And uh, he, in fact, worked for every penny he got. Where was that? In North Vancouver. Oh, yeah. North Vancouver went bankrupt then, didn't it? Well, that was a, you know, they give the person the option. And my dad, like, like I say, most of the people there, uh, they didn't use the automatic shovels to load trucks. They so load them by hand with hand shovels. It was a make work project. Your old man. Was tried involved, so man didn't doubt, feel he was taking money for nothing. Much obliged. Well, the two sides to the story, I suppose. Go yeah. ahead, please. You know, I feel the same way, Mr. Webster, about uh, about this uh, uh, working for welfare. You know, for, I mean, I don't see nothing wrong with it, but they they should pay them like they uh, under the same idea they had years ago in the hungry thirties. I mean, I was one of them myself. I wouldn't accept welfare. I went up and worked for it, and it went at the same at the going rate then of the city workers and everything else, and you work so long until you worked, uh, you put in as many hours as what uh, paid your, what your welfare would have been, and then you were off for that length of time, and somebody else bad. in your place. I, I can't see nothing wrong with working for it. I, I, uh, I, I can't, I had two older brothers that sat in their rear ends and did nothing. I mean, uh, uh, and they're the same way today. They've, uh, they, they've, they uh, they have not got the, uh, Nowhere near what I have, and I mean, uh, I always believe in working for mine. I, I okay, don't think that's working, but I don't uh, believe in degrading a person. Like as you say, uh, just uh, uh, everybody knows they're they're working for welfare and so on. But the way it was in those days, you worked right along with the city crews or the park crews or anything. And you got nobody knew. You got the city rate. You, you did the X amount of hours to match the city rate against the welfare. Right. Good show, thanks very much. Well, Jack, if I may, we're not going the way I like to go, and that is that I'm here to talk about Port Alberni and what we have, some good things in Port Alberni. Um, and that is that uh, we've got a Harbour Park development going in. We're waiting anxiously to get official notification from TITSA. It's a million and a half dollar uh -huh. um, um, complex of which the, the city uh, will be paying for $400,000, which we think will be the impetus for the, for the tourism and the private business coming in. Secondly, um, we always get, you know, we're not flat on our back, but neither are we jumping for joy, of course, too. But the, the, the press we've had over the month, it's always doom and gloom and negative. Uh, they show boarded up stores and uh, uh, the, the Kitimat uh, North and Sentinel once uh, put a report in there that uh, Woodward's had closed. Uh, Woodward's is one of the most viable businesses in Port Alberni. They're doing well and strong. Uh, a business colleague in the mall had a call from England, her aunt, who was, uh, was so upset because she had heard that Port Alberni is empty, people had left, and she felt sorry for her because she had worked for three years so hard to build up the business. It's this type of negative reporting. Yes, some of the businesses are boarded up, but there are also businesses coming in. We, we have under construction a three and a half million dollar courthouse. The whole community fought earlier this year because there was a, a good chance that the provincial government was going to cut it off. We fought for it. Some other community didn't get it. Get it. We have 7-Eleven uh, coming in, pay less. Uh, the Mormon Church with a $700,000 addition. Uh, the Harbor Park Development, of course. Teleglobe, $2.5 million. So indeed, there, there's also good. business coming, coming in. Well said. Hold your breath. I'll take you from Albany after the break. Well, I realize that. Let's take this call from Albany to Paul Reitzman, the mayor, who says that the media has painted far too black a picture of a dire straits town, and it's not quite true, you say? It's not a balanced picture. Okay, go ahead from Albany. Okay, Jack. Be I, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to make uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, you know, we live in a beautiful area. We have a beautiful shelter harbor. It's only used for lumber. And? And uh, what, for years and years, we kept only this one thing. Well, we had ch chances for prisons. We had chances for mining. 
the Ocean Ranger is repaired in the Alberni Valley Harbor. Was. Why not keep it going on it? I think we need leadership. And I think it looks to me that this guy who is there now, he is doing pretty fair to try to get so much going as possible. He's got the same kind of accent as you. That's not your father, is it? No, but I appreciate the call, nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Well, he brought up a good point, uh, Jack, and that's the, the harbor situation, too. We have one ship in port sitting idle there. They'll probably do some good fishing now at the moment. There are two ships coming in during the weekend. If they don't settle the strike, the, the, the part-time that the mills are operating, we can't even ship our damn stuff. And that means that you know, we are not reliable suppliers. We can, we can deliver on time. We're not competitive. You know, it, it's not anymore that Canada can just sit back and wait for the orders to come in. We've got to be competitive. We've got to stand on our feet and we've got to hustle. Do you think the maritime employers or the Longshore Union give a damn about that? Unfortunately. Do you think they care for anybody else who's going to lose their job because of their strike cam lockout? Um, unfortunately not. I'm afraid you're right. Where am I now? Another call from Albany. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so I guess you're talking to me, are you? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I was just wondering with Paul here, I phoned him up about a problem that we had on our parks and recreation here. Mm -hmm. and that's letting people that are working steady have these uh, field houses they're building for parks and rec. Mm -hmm. Instead of these welfare people that could use it. I'm darn sure there's a heck of a lot of them could be using these free rent houses instead of people that are working steady. Yeah, that we addressed it on council on Monday, as a matter of fact, and uh, we are looking into it. I think I recognize the gentleman. Yeah, looking into in. it, though, uh, when you got four of them in the valley here, and two of them have got people that are already taking residence up that are steady working people, there well, must be something wrong here. Well, if, if we bring it up on Monday, and it is what, Wednesday today? What's, what's the complaint? I don't well, understand this. We have, we have excellent uh, recreational facilities, one, in the best, uh, one of the best in BC, and we have field houses on the various uh, parks and playing fields to cut down on the vandalism. And people live in them. People live in them. And people with steady catchers. jobs. He's complaining that people with steady jobs are getting these. Well, that's what he is saying. We, is I brought, he right? I don't know. We brought it up on Monday on council. Uh, and the directive has gone to the superintendent. I was away on Tuesday. I'm in Vancouver today. Right. I'll be back tomorrow, and then we go from there. And should people with steady jobs get these field house accommodations? If indeed they are people with steady jobs. I don't know. We have to look into that. And you say that the wrong people are getting these houses in this uh, tough time. Is that right, Caller? Yes, that's right. People with steady jobs, uh, their wives are getting the houses, and they are, uh, then their husbands, of course, are staying with them. You going to look into it, Your as, Worship? As I mentioned, uh, we brought it up on Monday. It's Wednesday today. Do you today. control the occupancy of the houses? Well, it's through Parks and Rec, but ultimately they're responsible the to... Uh, uh, Thanks to for raising it. Just let us know later on what they do about it, Colin. Right. J just if I may, Jack, and a couple of blows dealt to the, to the forestry industry is the, um, uh, what I find most inappropriate amount of tax increases. You know, we have been told restraint, uh, tighten your belt and what have you. That's fair enough. However, the taxable percentages by the British Columbia government, that means the amount of money you pay on, uh, on, your, on your assessed uh, um, amount of monies. The class three, the forestry industry, went up 33%. Industrial went up 18%. Machinery and equipment went up 12%. And the tree farm license went up 33%. You cannot gouge taxes on the one hand and ask for restraint on the other hand. Or be so, competitive on the other hand either. So we have asked the, um, the provincial government to reduce those amounts and the money saved, will be, which will be in the millions of dollars, to create jobs or to have jobs continued. Mind you, they have their own problems. The revenue from one big company alone to the government is down was down $200 million over a short period. Yeah, but you're ultimately much better off to have people work and yeah, let yeah. them pay taxes and be competitive. We are not competitive, that's the problem. But Bennett's short a billion dollars, perhaps, in his deficit. What does he do if he cuts his taxes? Go short a billion and a half? Well, if you, if you lower prices, then you become more competitive and you sell your stuff. And, and I think one of the major reasons we are in, 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 in this troubled time is that A, we buy on credit, and B, wages are too high. You see, when wages come down, the inflation will come down too. Everything. Have you is taken a cut as mayor? 
we, we did get no increase this year. What did you get as mayor? About 18,000, as a matter of fact. Not like Vancouver. Um, and Are you going likely, to recommend a cut for the mayor and council this year to show restraint? The, we will not have an increase. Uh, uh, we did not have an increase this year, and we will likely not have an increase uh, next year. My own business is, uh, is down some 50%. Go right. ahead, please. Yes, Jack. Mm. Uh, I, I'd like to disagree with uh, the mayor's comment that uh, uh, the media has painted uh, Port Alberni in a far too uh, dark a picture. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think the media has quite painted Port Alberni dark enough. Um, I work for a major transportation company, which I had the occasion to go to Port Alberni once every two weeks. And the way you can honestly tell how a, a city or a town or a province is doing, uh, you can pretty well judge it by the amount of freight that the town brings in. Right. And uh, the, the amount of freight going into Port Alberni has dropped drastically. The mayor has mentioned that there are uh, uh, businesses such as Woodworth which are doing extremely well. Well, I know That's that extreme. a lot of the town's uh, people that deal at Woodward, uh, for example, in grocery matters, deal because they can use a credit card. I've had a lot of people tell me that, uh, I'm, I'm talking not just lame, I'm talking like owners and managers of the Safeway stores and Super Value stores, that have told me, quite frankly, that the reason why Woodward's food floor in Port Alberni is doing so well is because they can operate on credit where Safeway and Super Value does not. You go down the major shopping mall, the new shopping mall in Port Alberni, and you could stand at one end and fire a rifle shot right clear to the other, you wouldn't be worried about hitting a soul. There's just not much going on in that town, and I don't think that uh, uh, this business of uh, people working for welfare or anything has, will do anything as far as uplifting the economy or strengthening the economic situation in Port Alberni. I think something has to be done with that town. It is a beautiful little town, but I think myself something has to be done. Some innovative new ideas have to be brought in. I don't have the answers myself, but uh, I know that the only thing that's keeping that town going at the present is a, a, a meager existence in the mill and the commercial fishing. The commercial fishing people did fairly well, but mm -hmm. by golly, Jack, uh, you know, I, I don't really think the media has painted that area black enough. Okay, bye. He's a, he's a visitor every two weeks. But well, he's, he's coming out negative and ends with on, on a positive note. The, the, uh, the statement that Clem Chappell made uh, last week or the week before is that the power of positive thinking doesn't pay the bills. Well, I suggest to you that the, uh, the power of negative thinking doesn't pay the bills either. The statement made by the OUW that people are eating out of garbage cans is not true. Who I, said that? One of the people on oh, the, the OUW. Council. It's not true. It's that type of, um, of media coverage that, uh, uh, that gives us a bad name. I'm not hiding the fact that things are tough, but there are also some, some good things, and especially, I should say, the fishing. And maybe it's a good opportunity now to, to give you that surprise I've been talking about. Uh, surprise? I don't like surprises. Well, that's okay, and and no, no. What's the surprise? You're not going to hit me over the head with something. Like that. Oh, would I do that, Jack? Oh my God, oh my! What? He has one. This is what we've got in Alberni. You know, it's this, it's an uh, Chinook salmon, a spring. Beautiful. Fresh. Yesterday. Gorgeous. Leave it to you in the. Um, no, 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 no. I the, think you got to take it back and give it to somebody in Alberni that needs it. Give it to the o OUW. That's the type of Yeah, I've would got you another do that? one. Would you give it to the OUW from me? I'll give it to I them. I would feel totally guilty if I accepted a present of such a. Let me see it. Jeez. Could I keep Don't it for five it. minutes and pretend I caught it? Yes. How's that? Where are you? Can you see it? Ooh. And here. Now, here. Doesn't that remind you of somebody? There are two, there are two bucks. Here's another one, as a matter of oh, fact. Give me I don't know if I can hold them, but I'll try it. No. Oh, I'm going to stink like a fishmonger. Yo. Oh! All I ask oh. people, come to Port Alberni. I can't guarantee you a... How's that? You got them, Reuben. Can you see them? You know what they are, Reuben? <laughs> These are fish, Reuben. These are salmon. And I caught them myself. Quick, take them away. <laughs> oh! <laughs> That's blood from me. The teeth. No, it's blood from the fish. Oh, that's magnificent. Well, University. Jack, Jack, but this is the time Pamela, of... Pamela, uh, bring over some paper towels yeah. at once. Here you go. Hey, please. See, this is some of the positive... Oh, P.U. This is some of the positive things we have in Port Alberni. You certainly have. The 20... The, the 25 How much pounders... How these... Sit down. How much of these fish what? How much of these fish what? 
Oh, it's... I mean, retail, what they want? Oh, six, five, six dollars a pound, hundred, hundred and fifty dollars. You know, I... July, August, and September, that and October... I'll make a deal with you. I'll give you a hundred dollars for the fish, and you give it to the I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. But since I have the opportunity, come down in August... Because I don't want you to carry them back. August, September, and October, it's the best fishing. Thousands of fish. Hundred dollars, is that fair? Uh, per fish? No, a hundred dollars. I mean, I'm generous, but I'm not fair crazy. Enough. Anyhow, come down to Port Alberni. We've got the best fishing, the safest boating. It's good for our industry. Look, you've been a jam this morning. And you've here, Port Alberni <laughs> is the salmon <laughs> capital of the world. I, I've got to put a plug in there. Oh, I don't mind. Jeff, you. Well, well, that was delightful. You came across. I wasn't quite sure what you were going to do when you came here this morning. You know, I thought, ah, yeah, another depressing story. You're remarkably good. Well, thanks for putting the button on too. Yeah, we are the salmon capital of the world, and those are some dollars. of the examples. It? How could we make that? Twenty-five more pounds. I tell you what, I'll do. We got fifty I'll pounders. And just a minute. Pounders. Just hold the horses. I'm thinking. I'll tell you what. I'll sell tickets around the station here. Do that. Yes. Sell tickets around the station for five dollars, and have a couple of drawers. We'll put them in the fridge in the cafeteria. That's where they came from, too. We put them in there as a matter of fact. This and morning. we'll sell tickets for five bucks a shot. And anything we get more than a hundred dollars for the winners, we'll send to you. Nothing fishy about that. Paul, best of luck. And I'm glad you were over this morning. And I'm glad you think the media, even if you're wrong, misrepresented you. It's nice to see people just standing up if, for the city. If, if I may, may end maybe on a bit of a philosophical note, you know. Yesterday mm -hmm. is history. Tomorrow is hope. And today we're trying to bridge both as best as possible. Be very careful. You're beginning to sound like Pierre Trudeau. Oh, thank you. Oh, Faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, and charity. Thank Port you. Port it's a good, good city to live in. We've got a lot, uh, a lot going for us. But I'm not hiding the fact that things indeed are tough. It won't stop, will it? Well, it's Port Alberni. Here we are, salmon capital it of the won't world. Stop. Okay, give Thanks, me a check sir. for 100 bucks now before it goes. <laughs> and then after that, we'll sell it and we'll send any extra money to the... You'll give it to the... Unemployed. I'll give it to the OUW. OUW. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Much obliged. Thanks, Jack, very much. Wait till the end of the break. Take it away. A little bit. Red Vader. I was just asking Dr. Endicott, who's really an old buddy of mine. I first interviewed you when in the 50s. Yeah. Describe my activities in those, and I'll try not to blush. Well, you were a bit of a red baiter, and you were uh, pretty reactionary, much more so than you are now. Isn't that funny? I would, I would have thought I was much more reactionary now than I was then. No. But I was caught up in the whole commie uh, yeah, sure. CCF union battle in British Columbia. Yeah. And I pitched my tent with a white block mm -hmm. against uh, Prochette and Dalskog yeah. and... The red block. The red block. <laughs> the white block and the red block. Yeah. And I was, was I a nasty character as a red beta? F fairly nasty at times, yes. <laughs> and you think I'm now much more to the left than I was then? I think you've improved. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. <laughs> Dr. Endicott is in town, and there's a great story in Dr. Endicott. The United Nations is on the week, and we'll get the plug over right now. Monday, half past 12, you're going to lecture at Simon Fraser University. I've done that. Oh, you've done that? This is all done. Yeah. Oh, you're all finished? And UBC and uh, two other meetings. Now, Dr. Endicott was a guy who used to be an advisor, as I recall, to Chiang Kai-shek. For a short time. For a short time. I learned better. And <laughs> then you pitched your, um, you, you nailed your flag to the mast of Mao Zedong. Yes. Is that co correct? Well, to the Chinese Revolution. The Chinese Revolution, the People's yeah. Revolution. And what happened to your career in Canada? shortly thereafter, Dr. Endicott. Tell me the story about the apology eventually. Well, I came home and the first thing I did was to lecture across Canada on the, the nature and purpose of the Chinese Revolution. And it was justified and, and what's more, it was going to win, as I said, in 48 and 49, and it did win. Well, there was a, a great deal of uh, uh, hostility because a Christian shouldn't speak well of communists and how could the communists uh, 
organize anything good because everybody knew they were only capable of evil and all that sort of thing. And that's when a lot of the hostility developed. And at that time, were you not uh, removed from your particular ministry? Oh, no. I uh, resigned from the mission and the ministry in 1946 in China. Voluntarily, I wasn't kicked out because I realized the kind of opposition I was uh, arousing, you see. And um, uh, I came back to give my time to, first of all, explaining the Chinese Revolution and opposing American policies to try to overthrow it by military force, which they tried to do right up to the time Nixon went to apologize for the policy. But in, in you, therefore, you were fairly broadly vilified by the United Church of Canada. Yes, I was, and also by the politicians. And the media. Yes. And what finally happened in August 1982? Well, the, the, it began earlier than that under uh, Al Forrest, the editor of the United Church Observer. They began to feel that they'd, they'd made a mistake, they'd underestimated me, estimated me wrongly, and with the new developments that have come, uh, they, they felt they owed me an apology, which they did very graciously, that they had hurt me unnecessarily, and they now recognize that the peace crusade that I had been at the head of for a while uh, was really a, prof a, a prophetic effort. And worthwhile. And worthwhile. Because I remember you took an awful lot of heat when you said that the Americans were using germ warfare in Korea. Didn't yes, you? yes, that, that, was the, in, that was in 1952. That was really the turning point. The church had been not too hostile up to that time, mm -hmm. but everybody thought that the Americans could never do such a thing. Well, you know now that the, the um, uh, Freedom of Information Act is bringing out material which has fairly well proved that not only did they use it, but Canada had a part in it. Uh, Dr. Endicott brought along this cover I showed earlier this morning. Uh, an American military policeman with United Nations insignia and the Stars and Stripes against a map of an occupied Soviet Union and the Ukraine. October 27, 1951, Collier's Magazine. Russia's defeat and occupation, 1952 to 1960. The article isn't here, but what did the article oh, say? Oh, it was a whole edition. And it had Walter uh, Ruther saying how he went over and set up free trade unions in the Soviet Union, and uh, all sorts of, they were going to really liberate and restore lib uh, free enterprise capital in the Soviet Union. You look at the list of the writers there. Edwin Canham, head of the uh, Atlantic Monthly, and J.B. Priestley, and all sorts of people. J Philip Wiley, Walter yeah. Ruther, yeah. Robert <laughs> Sherwood, yeah. Hanson Baldwin, Lowell yeah. Thomas. Yeah. Walter Winchell. Walter he, Winchell. He has Edwin an article. Arbato. How I parachuted into the Urals and helped to seize all the Soviet. Uh, this was atomic. the fantasy of what they wanted to see done. This is what they wanted to do. Edward R. Murrow. Yes. He was there too. Yes. He yeah. boo booed once anyway, then, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. The late Edward R. Now, Murrow. The essence of the peace movement. In 19, which began in 1948, was a conviction on our part, which was based by a lot of knowledge. You know, I, I, I don't like to admit that we got a lot of information from guys like Phil Kilby and, uh, and Ross McLean and Burgess and so on, but we did. Well, not Ross McLean. No, no. The other McLean, McLean yeah. and Burgess. Yes. Kim Philby. Yes, and others. And we knew that the Pentagon was determined to have a war a preventive nuclear war, probably by April 1949. They believed that they had the maximum of superiority at that time, you see, and they were really promoting it, and they, and they were talking about it. Well, we, we countered it with uh, a massive uh, <coughs> Congress in Paris and the launching of the Stockholm Appeal, which said we demand the absolute prohibition of nuclear weapons and the acceptance of the principle of peaceful coexistence and no war. And, and it, it was quite effective. It helped. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that it decided the thing. One of the th decisive things was that they just, they, they, the Pentagon boys discovered that there were two million Maquis in, Paris, in France. There were a million <laughs> Maquis in Italy and all over the place. And they had said, no war. And, and they came out with a pamphlet led, by the way, by Abbe Boulier, mm -hmm. a famous French priest who had been in the underground 
the Vatican removed him later. But he's, they said, once again, we don our armor. If you try any war like that, you'll have the whole underground of Europe fighting you. And the Americans realized that was true. You made the effort of, uh, well, one thing I must ask you. You said you got information from Kim Philby. It's only a little. But was he then in another apparatus, or was he just feeding stuff to peace movements? I suppose it was coming through the Soviet sources. Soviet sources. Yes. yes. But, but uh, in your case, the we, end... We never had any contacts with him. Uh, no, but I mean, in your I'm, case... I'm the, talking now hindsight. That's right. The end I, justified I, the means, and it may have prevented a prevented nuclear strike yeah. in '49. Now then, what am I here for now? Yes. I am saying that this cruise missile and the agreement of Canada to test, test it and make it, we're making the brains of it in Toronto, is a new break towards making a new preventive nuclear war. This is a first strike weapon. And you watch the, the, the propaganda down in Washington. Nuclear war is winnable. Nuclear war is survivable. This is lunacy. And, and I really was appalled that uh, Mr. Trudeau made this uh, confidential speech to the Canadian people and never mentioned a single word about the problem of disarmament and the danger of war. All we need is to have love and trust together, you know, and we can walk hand in hand under the guidance of the, of the cruise missile into a brilliant uh, nuclear death. <laughs> you know, that's what's facing us. And, and, and that's more important than any economic problem that we have facing us. Because if we don't stop this thing, we may all disappear and smoke. More with Dr. Endicott after the break. Dr. Endicott is convinced that the cruise missile is a prevent, preventive nuclear strike, preventive war nuclear strike weapon. That's right, first strike weapon. A first strike weapon. Yeah. Well, now where does the peace movement stand today? Is there a peace movement today? Is there an effective peace movement today? Is oh, there yeah. any peace movement anywhere but in the Western world? There's a very big peace movement in the Western world, and in Canada now particularly, the whole coalition, this whole week of disarmament, it's going to end up with a massive demonstration up in Ottawa on, uh, on the 30th of October. I'm going to be one of the speakers. Now, there's nothing to be ashamed of socially to be a member of an anti-nuclear uh, <laughs> war group, is there? Not now, no. You know, it was effective even in the early years. You know, Kissinger wrote a book called Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, and he has several pages complaining that the World Council of Peace was so effective in promoting anti-nuclear uh, education that we, we had made people believe that it was practically immoral, and he regretted that. <laughs> but anyway, by the way, you're going to have Linus Pauling here. Yes, I am. Yes. And he's one of the pugwash scientists who warned us in the 50s, mankind must get rid of nuclear weapons or nuclear weapons will get rid of mankind. That's still true. And I am really appalled at the, at the uh, propaganda coming out from nitwits like Kaspar Weinberger that, that nuclear war is winnable and survivable. They just don't know what they're talking about. They're well, what about our prime minister? He, not only did he not mention disarmament, he capers around in an F-18 jet, which we're buying for five point some billion dollars, one a month for four years or something. Was he not a man in whom you had great faith at one time, was really an international figure who could lead Canada on the path to sanity? No, I didn't, never had that much faith in him. I thought he might be a good liberal reformer, as Laurier and others were, but uh, I, I'm not so concerned about what kind of an expensive jet he has as to what sort of real policies he has. Does he have any from your point of view? Not very much, because, you know, I, I'm a, a Christian Marxist and a, and a Marxist revolutionary. I think it's all nonsense to talk about Trudeau being responsible for the, for the depression, which is what they did in the federal election, three federal elections we had in Toronto. Uh, my, old, my old friend Dave Ketchum in the student Christian movement wrote a sarcastic poem about free enterprise, and, and one f verse ended up, Depressions, after all, my friends, are acts of God. Who ever thought of blaming business for them, you know? Depressions come right out of the nature of free enterprise capitalism. Free enterprise capitalism had everything its own way in, in the 1920s. No trade unions, no government intervention. <laughs> riding high, wide, and handsome, and what did they bring about? They brought about the Depression and Hitler. 
That's how much confidence I have in them. And it isn't the fault of Hitler or Joe Clark or anybody else. They, they are simply uh, trying to uh, moderate the mess. You might find a surprisingly large number of people right now in Canada who would agree with you that free enterprise capitalism, laissez-faire, social democracy doesn't work. It's, it's ended its usefulness. It did work for 200 years. It, 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 everything is in the process of developing and fading away, and it's, it's one of them. What kind of social structure must we have? But be practical, please. We will, well, I don't know. We have to work that out. But certainly we will have to have, it's in the cards, it's in the course of revolution. We will have to have a cooperative type of society that uh, regards the economic system as a part of human welfare. It'll never happen. Oh, yes, it will. The nature of the human beast. He's greedy. He's selfish. I know, and he'll be changed. He'll he, be changed after the Holocaust, maybe. No, no, there won't be a Holocaust, I think. There's a great danger, but I don't think there will be one. No, he'll be changed by education and by the fact that his environment has changed and his whole social outlook uh, of his elders has changed. The environment itself, as such, of course, despite the nuclear explosion, is a lot better than it was when you were a boy. Yes, of course it is. Uh, I mean, the life expectancy is vastly improved. Living yes. conditions are vastly yes. improved. And even this present crunch we're in right now, we surely won't see the grimness of the 30s. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not underestimating the capitalist system. It's done extraordinary progress. It's been responsible for enormous uh, uh, change, and, and good change as well as bad. But there comes a time when it has reached the end of its usefulness. And you think that time is now? It's coming. In, yeah. in our time? I, I think so. If I live another five years, I'll, I'll begin to see the big changes, I think. Simply because there's no outlet. Mm -hmm. And people expect, especially in North America, expect certain yeah. standards but of affluence. Whatever your opinions on these, the main thing that I'm concerned about right now is that we shall focus on the the disarmament question on stopping the, the uh, preventive war plans, the, the cruise missile, expose these people who are talking about the winnability of nuclear war and the survivability of nuclear war. It's not only nonsense, it's a big criminal lie. Well, Eisenhower won the, one of the few good things he did, the, to beware of the military industrial complex in the United States. And surely they're still in the driver's seat. They certainly are. The economy of the United States is in de real depression as far as automobiles, steel, uh, all these things are concerned. It's in a recession as far as the high technology and the computer business and so on. But it's in a boom as far as the, the, the armaments, the sale of armaments, the preparation of armaments. And they're going to get $1,600 billion in the next five years to boom it on. But it doesn't seem to bring automatic uh, recovery to the economy, does it? No, but it, would pre it will prevent us from being so disastrous as it was in 1929. There was no uh, uh, big armaments boom then, you see. It only began in 37. When so we therefore, we must all become Christian Marxists. Yes. We must all become Christian Marxists, and we must accept total sharing on an egalitarian, bureaucratic level among the whole no, world. No, you don't have to do that. There's no reason whatsoever why, why we should repeat the mistakes and the, and the uh, very bad things that were done in the Soviet Union or China. We can be much more intelligent than that because we are coming later and we can... Uh, Time for one segment of calls to the famous Dr. Endicott after the break. Dr. Endicott, stock question I've got to ask you. You know, I admire your principles, your dedication, your uh, sainthood now after the years of attack, <laughs> <laughs> St. Endicott, but there's always a stock question. There ain't no peace movement in the enemy camp. Well, I know they talk that. There is. Um, it is true, and there's no use denying it, that any peace movement or any organ, people's organization in the Soviet Union, China, or the Eastern Bloc is controlled by the government and is, uh, has to, in most important questions, agree with the government. That's true. But I know the Soviet people very well, and they want peace, and they will support 
wholeheartedly any proposal that, that we think is honest and sincere and will lead to peace. They will support it. We can count on that. But we're in the hands of two dictators, two potential madmen. The guy who happens to be at head of the Soviet Union and the guy who's at head of the United States. Yeah, but that's who can different. push the button. You, 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 you can't underestimate the force and the power of the people. Mm -hmm. You know, they used to talk to that way about me and about Poland. Well, look what happened. <laughs> you know, it's blown up, hasn't it? Solidarity was a great success, but too much freedom, so they chopped its head off. Well, all right, it'll come back, don't worry. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, out of the thousands of very strong pro-disarmament people in the, in the country, uh, shouldn't uh, the focus of attention um, be going to places such as uh, Lytton and other arms supplies? Uh, oh, he's asking and, about the, the sabotage at Lytton Industries. Yes, well, I mean, this has gone to extreme, but rather than just uh, constantly um, educating the public on the, the evils of nuclear warfare, it's time, I believe, to uh, to actually have long vigils and picketing at these places and, and sort of press a point a little farther. Rather, um, I don't mean bombing them or anything like that, but we have to get right to the crux of the matter, I think, and uh, stay away from okay. all Okay, the... we've got your point. What's your response, Dr. Endicott? The Christian forces in Toronto and the disarmament forces have picketed the Lytton Industries regularly, at least two or three times a year. Now, we don't believe in... Uh, that kind of mass bombing or uh, terrorism and so on. However, I would like to, men uh, to point out that while all uh, so much has been said in deploring 500 pounds of dynamite, the cruise missile is a thousand times more <laughs> explosive. Oh, that's what we're a making. A million times more Yeah, explosive. that's what we're making. But uh, we are having parades and, and vigils. And a la Trident submarine base. Yes. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Dr. Endicott. Um I agree with most of what you have said, um, but I'm thinking about what you said about a future world of sharing, and I'm just wondering if um, human nature will allow people to share in such a way as you wish. And thinking of this, I also think of Reaganomics, which bases um, its argument on giving to the rich, and the rich will pass on down to the poor, you know, that relies on sharing, and I, I think it, that's what we're failed. Okay, we've got the point. Here's a response. Well, I could preach a little sermon both to you, to Jack and to you, and by my friend, uh, the Christian Marxist, uh, Joseph Needham of Cambridge University. He says, we have no reason to suppose that our present condition of civilization is the last masterpiece of universal organization the highest form of order of which nature is capable. I believe there are many grounds for seeing in collectivism of the, time w of the kind we could approve a form of organization as much above the outlook of middle-class capitalist nations as their form of order is superior to that of primitive tribes. In other words, there's a close connection between inorganic matter and organic matter and human life and the form of organization that is going to come into being, he says, has the full force of evolution and the authority of evolution behind it. If you look at the human development in this life. In other words, it'll come naturally. Not naturally, it'll come by struggle because all change comes by struggle. But I also believe that this kind of society has the full force of the prophetic religion and spirit of Jesus behind it. And I believe it's coming. That's my answer. I never thought of you as a fundamental evangelist in that form. I'm not a fundamental evangelist, I'm a... You believe the kingdom of Jesus Christ will eventually come out of a form of superior collectivism as far above middle class standards as we are as far above the aborigines of New Guinea. Yes, and it will have the full force of evolution behind it, as well as the full force of, if you believe in God, the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. I suppose I believe in God. <laughs> well... I'll leave you my little sermon. No, 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 don't leave me. Don't <laughs> worry me. Thinking is a great strain on a professional talker. Yes, I know. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't laugh quite so sardonically. <laughs> I have a suspicion you might be able to see through me on occasion. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes. Dr. Endicott, uh, in the first part of this century, we had two brutal world wars, and by the best estimates, literally 40 million people were killed. Mm -hmm. Now, the best weapons are those that preserve our freedom without having to go to war. And these nuclear weapons have only been used twice 
And from the way I look at it, they seem to be better than bows and arrows or guns in saving life. I mean, they're horrible, but could you explain why we should get rid of weapons which have allowed us to be free and have not killed the millions of people that conventional weapons have? I'll get off now. Thank well, you. I, I think that's a completely phony argument, that, that uh, the, the more horrible your, your threat of weapons is, the more likely you're going to have peace because one of these days somebody will use them and as I've been trying to point out to you, the uh, political lunatics down in Washington now are proclaiming that they can have a winnable war and a survivable war. They're planning to use them. They're not just simply for, for deterrence, they're, they're for being used. And but there's another point that strikes me, surely. Is it not a danger with the use of nuclear weapons starting with the crews and finishing with your satellite orbited bombs? that you could wipe out mankind. Of course, there's, there's a very great likelihood that if you go on preparing it and ever actually use them, that's what will happen. I told you that's what the scientists of Pugwash said. Mankind must either get rid of nuclear weapons or nuclear weapons will get, get rid, rid of, of him. mankind. After the break. A couple of calls. Well, I must admit, you're, you're very informative and you make one think, Dr. Endicott. Well, I'm glad of that. Go ahead, please. How old are you, by the way? 83. 83. Good till you're 100. Hmm? Good till you're 100. I doubt it, but then... You want to stay till you're 100. One thing I would like to do is to go out of life kicking and squalling just like I came in. <laughs> <laughs> go, go ahead to Dr. Endicott. Where are you? Hello. That's you. Dr. Endicott? Yes. Yes. I'd like to talk about that word, educate. Well, do talk, ma'am. Well, any... not all the so-called Christians are going for disarmament. Some of our born-again MPs are in favor of military might, including the cruise missile. Are you friendly with Christians who are born again in favor well, of nuclear Well, uh, he mentioned that he was a Christian Marxist. Are yeah. you a Christian first, and then you become a Christian Marxist? Yes, I'm a Christian first. Well, what's a Christian Marxist? A Christian Marxist is a Christian who is intelligent enough to know that scientifically there's a great deal of truth in the Marxist analysis of our economic system and uh, in Lenin's analysis of the imperialism, the last stage of capitalism. And how he acts on it. How are we going to go about educating these people who have power, like MPs? You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian Marxist and uh, a Christian science, uh, a Christian for science in the sense that I don't think we have to have prayer meetings about typhoid. We have science to to cure the water supply. Go ahead, please, from Squamish. Good morning, Jack. Morning. <clears throat> I have two questions for Dr. Endicott. Right. Uh, one is, uh, he uh, proclaims to be a, a Marxist, uh, or a Christian Marxist, and I was wondering what he would call the people in Poland right now who are suffering under the dictatorship <clears throat> of supposedly uh, Marxist uh, government. And uh, he, he imposes that, uh, supposes that in the future we're all going to become this way. And uh, they think the Canadian people who are suffering the greatest recession and almost depression since the 1930s are willing to sit back and be told by Dr. Endicott that the future holds a better world. Look at Poland as an example. <laughs> no, I, I don't expect them to take Poland as an example. I expect the Canadian people to be intelligent enough to make their own way. And uh, oh, Dr. Endicott, I'd like to ask you too, what would, you, what, what would be your answer to the problem of having Russia sometime, say, before the end of this century, happen to move into Europe, Western Europe, and with conventional forces only. No nuclear weapons are involved, but just the Russians move into Western Europe. What could be the American response? Their forces there are not enough to keep them back. They're okay, good question. One. He's saying, what should be the response, say, of the West, the Americans particularly, I suppose, if the Russian forces with conventional weapons only moved into Western Europe? They should be resisted. Uh, any uh, military aggression should be resisted. And uh, that includes the American aggression in Vietnam, which most of you people didn't resist. <laughs> But I did. <laughs> that, that, that's very simple, that question. Fair enough. They huh? should be resisted. Well, I, I hope I'm still here five years from now, and you're still here five years from now, and we'll have another batch of whatever the cause is, if we have survived that long. If we get a general agreement to abolish nuclear weapons and have a controlled and reasonable disarmament, that problem of the Soviet Union invading Europe won't arise. 
Now, I have a little piece of business I must do, Dr. Endicott. A week ago Monday, I interviewed the Liv Bandiero, the girl who had been charged with the murder of her three-year-old boy. And after long, protracted arrests and bail, when neighbors come into a rescue, the Crown finally stayed the proceedings. She had taken that child to six doctors, as you may well recall. And it's not often a woman accused of abusing a child will go from doctor to doctor to doctor to ask what the purple patches were. Well, I also suggested that the chief coroner should hold quickly a public inquiry into all aspects of this case. And I'm glad to tell you that the chief coroner is actually flying somebody over to Cortez Island on Sunday, I hope that's not a double time day, uh, to start the inquiry with Mrs. Bandieri. And they also want a copy of the interview we did. We'd be pleased to let them see it. But one little thing came up. As you know, people have said, how could she have 29,000 total legal bills when she didn't even go to a preliminary hearing? Don't know the answer to that. May not be 29, it may just be about 15 left to pay. But one bill she has is for $1,700 from a doctor for his opinion, which seems, I haven't seen the report, to the, be the opinion that convinced the Crown there wasn't a murder charge, the child may have died of a condition of the symptom of which is purpura. So I don't see why the Chief Crown has been so slow about it. Could have called a public inquest two weeks ago. We don't need an investigation into an investigation into an investigation. Let's have some action in public. Okie dokie. You see, I go, I'm like a butterfly. Crisis to the end of the world to my little <laughs> local stories and this and that and the next thing. But I suppose we perform a function. You're an evangelism for good and I'm an evangelist for profit. Okay. Eh? Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. <laughs> my thanks to Dr. Endicott. I'll be back after the break. It's what you might call a very fishy program this morning. I actually cut my finger on these giant spring salmon, which we're going to raffle just in the office. Five bucks a ticket to add to the hundred bucks I gave them to give to the unemployed council in Port Albert Nye. I thought right smug was going to be dull, but he turned out to be quite bright and certainly a good booster for Albany. Tomorrow we've got the big Lalonde statement and we'll have the Minister of Finance on the phone sometime during the program, if we can understand what his initial announcement was this afternoon and perhaps of an expert here to interpret what the program means for the nation as such. We're also going to do a program tomorrow morning with a couple of doctors who want to correct me and my bad habit last year of putting on drug companies to plug their products. At 9 a.m. precisely. The Port Alberni story with Mayor Reitzma on check at midnight. Some truths about new drugs tomorrow on Webster at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs> <laughs> 